The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name, the name of victorious, of Jesus extol. His kingdom is glorious, he rules over all. The eternal punishment that awaits. Dad was trying to save my soul. He, he did not want me to spend eternity in the devil's hell. And I love him for it. I chasten his memory. I, I, I uh, cherish his memory. And uh, uh, he's precious to me because he loved my soul. And I read in Romans chapter 6, and verse 23, where the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I tell you what, you spend your time serving the Lord, and His grace comes in. We couldn't earn our salvation. We can't merit our salvation. Now, we can meet the conditions of it and receive God's grace. You know, sometime Christ said something like this, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? And so we have responsibility to obey the Lord. But you know, the wages of sin is death. And so uh, wages back there meant that there was going to be a payday coming. And we work during the week, and we expect to pay check at the end of the week, right? <laughs> or sometime. Well, sin has its wages. And the wages of sin is death. And that's eternal separation from God. That's in outer darkness where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And let me tell you, brethren and friends, I don't want to go there. Now, what is sin? The wages of sin is death. Well, 1 John 3, 4 says that sin is a transgression of the law. I knew when I had disobeyed my dad when he told me to do something and I didn't do it. Or I did the opposite. I knew I, I was guilty. And if he found out about it, I knew that I was going to be punished. My friends, if we transgress God's law, God loves us. He doesn't want us to do that. He would have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, right? He's long-suffering. He doesn't want any to be lost. And yet at the same time, God is just. He's omni-just. And so when we violate his law and the system of morality and ethics found in the word of God is based upon his very nature, then there must be punishment. And we can understand that. And we don't want to have that eternal punishment from Jehovah God. In Matthew chapter 7, in verse 21, beginning, we find that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many shall come unto me, unto me in that day, day of judgment, and shall say, Lord, did, not we, did we not prophesy in thy name? And in thy name cast out demons, and in thy name do many mighty works. But he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. And so, 
There are those who don't call upon the name of the Lord. They don't obey his will. And they'll make all kinds of excuses in the day of judgment if I understand that scripture correctly. And I want us to talk about another scripture for a few minutes. And I think we can, we can notice it. I, I don't know what all will take place in, in the day of judgment. But I, knew, I do know what I read in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, and I know what I read in Matthew chapter 12. If you will, let's turn to Matthew chapter 12. The Bible says in Matthew 12, verse 38, Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, Christ, saying, Teacher, we would see a sign from thee. Well, no telling how many signs... Christ had already done. We would see a sign from thee. They were testing him. They were trying him. They were trying to find something to condemn him about. And so his reply is, but he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. Now, what happened relative to Jonah the prophet? For as Jonah was in, was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, great fish, the dag, so shall the Son of Man be three days in the, and three nights in the heart of the earth. You believe that? What is he saying? You know about Jonah? In the Old Testament, he was three days and three nights in the heart of the great fish. He's a sign that I will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jonah came forth from that fish and finally went to preach to Nineveh. Christ said, I'm going to come out of the grave. That was a sign. Now notice, beginning in verse 41, we begin to see the attitude of these folk who are criticizing Christ. They, they, they're determined not to obey. The men of Nineveh shall stand up in judgment with this generation. Now do you understand all that? Sometime we talked about witnesses for us and witnesses against us. Have you thought about the fact that there may very well be witnesses for us and witnesses against us in the day of judgment? This generation, the men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation as shall, and shall condemn it. Now, now what about the men of Nineveh? For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. And you won't listen to me. I'm the son of God. But you don't want to hear me. All you want to do is complain and criticize and try to find something to make light of me about. And some excuse to reject me. And then he says, the queen of the south, the queen from Sheba, the queen of Sheba, shall rise up in the judgment against this generation or with this generation as she, and shall condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth, way down in southern Africa, to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. You won't go across the street to hear me. And then he says, but the unclean spirit, when he has gone out of a man, a demon, passeth through waterless places seeking rest, and findeth none, findeth it not. And he saith, I'll return into the house from which I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Oh, it's clean. 
There's nothing in there. All right? The wickedness is gone. Then goeth he and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man becometh worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this generation. Did you know that when the Pharisees and the scribes and everybody back there that rejected Christ, when they stand before God, this indicates that God may very well call those in Nineveh who repented at the preaching of Jonah and said, what did you do when you heard Jonah? You repented in sackcloth and ashes from the king to the lowest person, most humble person in Nineveh. Now, why didn't you do that when you heard me? All right? He may call the queen of Sheba, who, who made that long journey to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And you would not put forth the effort and give heed to my preaching. Now, why was that their attitude? Well, these were religious people. They claimed to be following the law of Moses. And uh, they claimed to be righteous. But Christ said, you're deplorable. The judgment's going to be rough on you. And he talked about their attitude. He talked about the de a demon inhabiting somebody. And he uses this as an example here. That's a departed spirit of a wicked person who is allowed back there during the miraculous times to inhabit somebody, the spirit, this unclean spirit. And here's this unclean spirit in a person. And uh, he, he is cast out by the Lord or one of the apostles, whatever, he's cast out. And this person is cleaned up. And this spirit doesn't want to go back into the Hadean world, Tartarus. And so he walketh in dry places seeking rest, another place to occupy. So he doesn't have to go back into the, unclean world, and the uh, unseen world. And so he doesn't find any. And so he returns and he, and, and he says, hey, I had room in that fellow. And so I'm going, to try, I'm going to try to get back in there, into that person who had been cleaned up. And he found him empty, swept, and garnished. Now, you know what? The evil was cast out of that fellow. But it's interesting that he didn't put something good back in its place. And that's what we have to do when the evil is cast out of us. We're cleansed by the blood of Christ. We're forgiven. And a lot of times we don't put the light of the word in, into our hearts and our minds. We, we're not busy doing those things that are right in the sight of God. You see? If there's darkness within our lives, what we need to do is to turn the light on. When, when the, uh, this room is dark, you can come in here with a broom and you can fight the darkness all you want to, you know, and you'll never drive it out of here. But if you'll flip a light switch, turn the light on, that'll handle the darkness. And so here this evil spirit says, hey, uh, here's too much room for me. And so he went and got seven others of his buddies, wicked spirits like himself, and they come in and dwell there. And Christ said, the latter state is worse than the first. And men, men and, and, and women, when we become children of God and when we fail to put godliness and righteousness and goodness 
and sensitivity and generosity and uh, a loving spirit and attitude in our heart, in our hearts and in our, into our minds, then I'll tell you what, that evil will come back into our lives. And when it does, Christ said that it will come back seven times worse than it was in the beginning. Can you imagine? I tell you what, some members of the church will do anything and say anything. Some of the meanest people I have ever seen in my lifetime were members of the church. And some of them claiming to be gospel preachers. Christ said that evil will come back and it'll come back worse than it was in the beginning. Now what had happened to the scribes and Pharisees and the Sadducees? They'd been cleansed, but they failed to put goodness back into their lives and in their hearts and righteousness. And so sin is going to be punished. And so here are these folk. And Christ said, the men of Nineveh are going to witness against you. I'm going to call them in the judgment. And I'm going to call the queen of Sheba because she went so far to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Now, I want us to talk about sin and obedience. And then we will talk about some other things if we have time. I don't know what's going to happen to the judgment, us at the judgment, at the judgment. But I know this, I know what I can read right here. And I know that when the Lord said, some will come unto me in that day and say, Lord, did we not cast out demons in thy name? That somehow or another they are going to be able to have their day. You know, everybody, every dog has his day. And I don't know what's going to happen, but let me tell you something. We don't want to be wicked in that particular day because they shall be turned into hell and all that forget God, the word of God says. Quickly, I want to notice some things that could happen in the day of judgment. And I want to notice some excuses that sometimes people make and that the Lord might possibly call up some to say, these po folk didn't use that excuse. They had the same situ possible situation that you had, but they didn't use that excuse. I think about the excuse sometimes that I hear, I'm not good enough to obey the gospel. I've heard that excuse, and you have too. And there might, might be some people who stand before God in the day of judgment and say, I didn't feel like I was good enough to obey the gospel. I didn't feel like I was good enough to become a Christian. Well, my friends, none of us is good enough. That's the reason why we need the mercy of God. I've spent a lot of time at West Clinic lately and uh, received tremendous uh, treatments that have helped me. I tell you what, there's sick folks there. What if I were to say, I don't believe they, they can help me because there's sick folks up there. And I don't, I don't believe they can help me because there's sick folks over there. I've heard people say, why, there are hypocrites in the church. It's interesting that the apostles could have said that about Judas. Why, Lord, there's a hypocrite among us. 
Would that have excused the apostles and said, all right, you can depart from the Lord then because there's a hypocrite, Judas. No, that wouldn't work. My friends, we can obey the gospel of Christ and we can throw ourselves on the mercy of God no matter what we've done. Did you know that, that the Lord may call up the Pentecostians on that occasion and might say, well, what, what did you folk do before the day of Pentecost? We crucified the Savior. I, I was one of them that said, shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Were you forgiven? Yes, sir. I repented. And the Lord forgave me. He may very well do that. Because he said, this same Jesus, whom you crucified, hath been made both Lord and Christ. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 36 through 38. But then there are those who say, well, I don't know enough. Do you remember when Philip went down to uh, the way that goeth from, uh, toward the south to, from Jerusalem to Gaza? And he didn't know what to do. And here comes a man in a chariot. And, and the Lord tells him, the Spirit says, or the angel Go join thyself to this chariot. And the Bible says he ran through to that chariot. You know what? The Lord, when a person uses this excuse, I don't know enough. He may call up the Ethiopian nobleman. And he may say, Mr. Nobleman, how much did you know? The Bible says that he began at the same scripture, Philip, and preached unto him Jesus. And when they came to a certain water, he said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And he made the con good confession. And he was baptized into Christ. You don't have to know the complete scriptures in order to be baptized scripturally. We become children of God and then we learn more. We need to know some things. Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. We know, need to know about the kingdom and the name of the Lord Jesus and so forth. We need to know about remission of sins. But some think, well, if I can't know everything, then I can't become a Christian. Well, the Ethiopian nobleman didn't know everything. But somebody might say he may come before the Lord and he's not prepared for the judgment, and uh, he's in his sins, and uh, the Lord, he may say to the Lord, try to use this excuse. Well, I would have gone against my family. Well, the Lord may call. You know whom he may call? He may call Saul of Tarsus. And he might say, uh, uh, Paul, uh, what about your family? What, what were they religiously? Most of them were Pharisees. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Well, did you depart from them when you learned the truth? Yes, sir. Because I had to save my soul. And then I could help save them. There were some of Paul's family in Christ before he was. But I have an idea that most of them were not. And so Paul, Saul of Tarsus, went against his family religion, so to speak. But somebody says, well, I can't obey the gospel. I couldn't obey the gospel, tell Christ that, because I was too busy. I was too busy. I think about the Ethiopian nobleman who wanted to worship God so badly according to, to what he knew, which he didn't know enough at that time, 
But he made a thousand mile journey all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship. And he was a eunuch, so he couldn't even get into the assembly. He had to stay in the court of the Gentiles. But then on the way home, when he had an opportunity to learn the truth, you know what? He wasn't too busy, even though he was the treasurer of Ethiopia. He was so busy. He was busy. He wasn't too busy for the Lord. My friends, if we're too busy for the Lord, we're just too busy. We're too busy to go to heaven. In addition to that, there are some that are going to say in the day of judgment, perhaps, Lord, I would have become thy child, but you know what? Your religion wasn't popular enough. There, there weren't many people down at that church. And, and I just decided to go to the big church. Now, my friends, I don't think those in the first century looked for popularity when they obeyed the God. He may very well call up Cornelius and his household. And Cornelius was told to send for Peter who would come and teach him words whereby he and his household might be saved. The first Gentile converts. How many Gentiles were Christians? He was the first one. But it didn't bother him that he and his family would be the first ones. He learned the truth and he obeyed it. All right? And then there are those who might say, uh, I, I'm good enough, I don't have to obey, the, I don't have to be baptized. I don't have to become a Christian. Let, let me tell you what all I do. I, I help everybody. I am a great husband. I'm a great father. I, I, I do a lot for my community. Let me tell you how many things I do, do in my community. And I'm not a Christian, and I don't need to be a Christian. Well, the Lord may again call up Cornelius. Cornelius was a good man. Cornelius prayed to God always. Gave much alms to the poor. And yet, Cornelius needed to hear words whereby he and his household might be saved. And so the Lord might say, what's your excuse? Here, here's Cornelius, and he did good works, but he realized he had to become a Christian. Good works alone wouldn't take him to heaven. If you would like to learn more about God's Word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth For The World, or visit us online at Truth For The World. Dot O-R-G. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim.